Is it okay? <laughs> Good afternoon. I've been asked to talk about the question here. Why do we need a monetary ecosystem? And the support for that actually comes from recent work on demonstrating that part of the instability of the official monetary system relates to its monoculture, its uh, monopoly. And that therefore, in fact, the kind of innovations that you're all doing should be welcome for the stability of the existing system, which is the opposite of what typically we hear. What do you answer when people tell you, well, you know, these uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are going to create a mess in the official system? Of course, you're going to expect this to hear from bankers or from central bankers particularly because the central banks are in the business of keeping the monopoly in favor of the banks for the last 300 years. Now, here's the answer in three steps. Conventional money by itself creates a whole bunch of problems, while the entire field of economics has been assuming, or actually implicitly assuming, that conventional money is completely value neutral. It's just a passive tool that makes exchanges more efficient. And therefore, you know, there's not, no baggage behind, behind it, which is proven wrong. And the second thing is, the claim I'm going to make is that the official system is structurally unstable, i.e. from the structure itself, from its monoculture, and that therefore, Bitcoin or any other innovations can actually play a very positive role to stabilize even the existing system, which is the opposite of what we typically hear. Now, let's start with some simplistic questions. How many of you have had at least one course of economics? All right. So actually, yeah, a small majority. So you'll have obvious answers to these questions. Who is creating money? Is it the government? Anybody believes that? No, I see a bunch of no's. Uh, seven years ago, the majority believed that. So we've been learning something with the crisis of 2007 and 2008. Is it the central banks? Okay, about half, right? Is it someone else? All right, so divide it. Uh, well, normally, it's someone else. Okay? The exception has been when central banks have to step in because nothing happens. Uh, but in the conventional system, all supposedly national currencies are created privately by banks uh, when they make a loan. Uh, and they do that, of course, with interest. So. How many of you have used another complementary currency other than Bitcoin? Okay, may I ask what kind? Pardon? Delico? All right. Anybody else? All right. Has anybody used frequent fire miles? Okay. Has anybody used loyalty currencies from supermarkets or bookshops or yes anybody those who lift their arms now have been using complementary currencies without knowing it and this has been going on for the last 40 years so be aware that this space exists before bitcoin appeared all right <laughs> there's a whole process that's been going on for the last 40 years already for creating media of exchange other than official money that actually is creating completely different dynamics. Now, here's my plan. Conventional money generates unsustainabilities. It is actually, my claim is, the main engine why our civilization is steaming ahead towards a wall of unsustainable behavior patterns with a whole bunch of consequences. 
The second thing is the systemic cause of monetary instability, which is the new research that I've been telling you about. What the systemic solution is, when you understand the systemic problem, you know where to look. And then some conclusions. I'm going to provide four examples of unsustainable behavior patterns that are generated by the conventional money. It amplifies the business cycle. It makes economic growth compulsory. People who talk about zero growth or degrowth don't understand the money system because it is mathematically impossible as long as you maintain the currency the way it is. The third one is it concentrates wealth automatically, not only when you do special things, like being particularly bright or something, which is another assumption that's often made. Pe wealthy people are wealthy because they have been doing very brilliant things. And finally, it programs short-term thinking. So the people who say that we need to actually educate our CEOs to think differently because they have to think about their grandchildren are losing their time because they don't understand the reason why they automatically have to do that. So let me give you a few words of explanation of each one of those. By the way, if I say something that is not understood, stop me, right? I'm, don't wait for the end because you may lose each other. We may lose each other. If you agree with me, or probably, sorry, if you disagree with me and understand me, let's wait until the end, otherwise we may never get there, okay? <laughs> So that's the rules of, int of interaction, all right? Here is, when money is created, it always is pro-cyclical. When there is an uptick, there is a business cycle, right? The, the green or the blue line here is also called the inventory cycle. The car companies produce cars. There is a period when they don't sell as many. The cars start accumulating an in inventory. Then you have to work it off, so therefore you actually reduce uh, output and, or lay some people off for a while in order to be able to reduce the production. That's the inventory cycle, which is a classical business cycle. However, because of the way money is created by banks through loans, what happens is when there is an uptick in the economy, they amplify this dramatically. When there's a downtick like we have now, they amplify it also on the other side. Central banks are supposed to try to counteract this stuff, but they don't succeed because they're actually dealing with an elastic in terms of not, it's not a command and control system. It's a very loose connection with interest rates, which provides only the cost of creating money, not the quantity. So that's the first one. The second one, compulsory growth. When a bank creates money, all right, say you go to buy an apartment, you borrow $100,000 or euros or yen or whatever it is uh, from your bank, they create 100000 out of nothing, okay? Fiat money, it's called, for that reason, i.e. The, the godly capacity to create something out of nothing, the first words of God in the Bible, in Genesis is fiat lux, that light be, and the next sentence is, and light was. It's the capacity to create something out of nothing. That's the technical description of our current monetary system. Well, so you borrow your 100,000, but you're required to bring back 200,000, right? So, in the next 20 years, say. Good. Uh, where does the second 100,000 come from? From someone borrowing money next year. If there is no growth next year and nobody borrows money, the money does not exist. So everybody goes bankrupt. So the compulsory growth is compulsory. It's not an option. It's not because we like growth that we do it. We have no option to have zero growth. So that's what the point is. Without new loans, without new growth, everybody goes bankrupt. Simply the money does not exist. When you pay back interest, you're actually using someone else's principle, right? Automatically. Third point, money is the way the money system operates, automatically concentrates wealth. Uh, that may sound shocking or surprising, 
but here is how it works. Question. What is the median wealth, the most frequent amount, that's what a median means, it's not the average, the median, the most frequent number of US household financial wealth? Does anybody have an idea? Guess a number? Nobody? Yes? Yeah? Pardon? $100,000. Anybody else has a, a number? Yes? I think low, maybe $10,000. $10,000. Okay. Let me give you the result from 2007, which was the last good year. Okay? Uh, it's zero. Okay? Uh, this is statistics coming from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So, in other words, you know, it's not my opinion. Uh, now, the other little thing that's interesting is Bill Gates in that same year is three and a half kilometers that way. Right? So, when we talk about concentration of wealth, it's not a minor phenomenon. Okay? Uh, everybody underestimates the mean, by the way. Okay? Today, it is likely to be negative, right? Because after the crash of 2007, 2008, lots of people have lost a lot more than still owe money, <laughs> and they don't have it. All right, here's the only study that has been made, and it's in Germany, about the effect of interest on the distribution of wealth. Okay. We all assume that you pay interest when you borrow money, correct? Not true. Not true. Well, here is the eight in Germany, and by the way, Germany is a country which had the lowest, but Switzerland, the lowest interest, interest rate in the world during this time period. Okay. So uh, this was the late period of the Deutsche Mark. So, you see, 80%, these are, these are deciles of households in Germany, and the red component is what they pay in interest, and the gray is what they receive in interest. So, all the 80%, the bottom one, pay roughly more, half or, uh, sorry, two times more interest than they receive. This, the second decile on the top breaks even, and everything goes to the top 10%. Now, here is how it works. Take garbage. This was actually the cost in Aachen, a city in Germany. As I remind you, the lowest interest rate. The cost of garbage collection has 12% interest. How come? Well, the garbage truck, the guy who makes the company that makes the garbage truck borrows money, pays interest on it. You may be sure that in the cost of that manufacturing, they calculate the cost of their interest in it. The steel company from whom they buy does the same thing. The shipping company that brings the steel from Korea to Germany has bonds, pays interest. So that's how it works, it's about 12%. It's not that the garbage collection company has a bond. It's just whatever they use. Whatever you buy, when you buy an apple, when you buy a car, you pay the interest of everybody who has been in the supply chain uh, borrowing some money somewhere. For drinking water, it's 38%. For public housing, it's 77%. So, without anybody doing anything, you automatically transfer what is interest is actually a transfer from people who don't have enough money to people who have more capital than they know what to do with. Correct? So it's a suction device, automatically. Now, third, fourth point, short-term thinking. We all have heard of the complaints that the CEOs are kind of thinking only on the short term and only worried about you know, their, well, their bonus at the end of the year or something. I make the reverse point. The bonus of the end of the year has been designed 
by people that actually want you to think short term, i.e. the financial system. Why is that? Are they bad? Are they doing that because they are trying to destroy the planet? No. They're following the logic of the currency. Let me see how that works. Let's assume that we have a very simple world. I have an investment in two types of trees, pine trees and oaks. And to make all the numbers easy, okay, we're going to assume after 10 years that an, a pine tree is worth $100, and after 100 years, an oak tree is worth $1,000. In that context, you know, basically you're indifferent between the two, because you can 10 times over 100 years do this. this is, all the numbers are adjusted for inflation. You know, they're all supposed to be, you know, uh, it's not an inflation exercise. Uh, so uh, it, it's indifferent. It can do 10 times the $100 and arrive at the end with that same. Let's assume you're using with a currency that has a 5% interest rate, okay? Which historically has been a low number, by the way, it's with the exception of the last seven, eight years. The discounted value of $100 over 10 years, seen from today, from, from this point, is $61.39. What does that mean? That if you take $61.39, put it in a bank account at 5% interest, you will, after 10 years, have $100. Right? When you do that with an oak, it's $7.60 over 100 years. In other words, if you put $7.60 compound interest for, for 100 years at 5%, you get $1,000. So seen from today, from this point, what do you invest in? The answer is pines. Nobody invests in oaks. Okay? And that's, oaks is a metaphor here. Okay? In other words, it's not, nothing to do with, we do the same thing with all kinds of other fields. Okay? with education, with health, and all this, you know, roads. I mean, we're, I claim that there is not a single nuclear power station, and this country has 70% of its energy produced by it, that is making any sense economically if you wash away the interest rate, which is artificial and nothing to do with reality. Okay? Because anything beyond 20 years is counted as zero. No cost. So, so it distorts everything we do. Uh, I once met the CEO of one of the largest German companies, and he had four children. And uh, we talked about his kids. And then afterwards, I raised the question, by the way, when you make a decision for your kids, what is the time horizon you use? And his answer was, well, 20, 25 years. You know? And when you walk in the office in the morning, what do you do? He said, one or two quarters. If I didn't do that, I'd get fired and replaced by someone who does. That's the reason. From a, from a shareholder viewpoint, they're using a currency with an interest. Therefore, the future doesn't matter. Now, the second point. The systemic cause for monetary instability. Some of you may remember. We were all adults and vaccinated by then for that little episode, the Lehman moment. Now, what's interesting, when they talk about the crisis these days, they always talk about the last crisis. Have you noticed? As if it's the only crisis. Interesting. Well, here are the statistics from the IMF. Between 1970 and 2010, there have been 145 countries with a banking crash like we had in uh, 2007, 2008. There have been 204 monetary collapses, like we narrowly avoided with the euro at that time, and possibly are going to go through one still today. And finally, there are 76 sovereign debt crises. We should count 77. We now have Greece, and added to the number. So that's 425 in 40 years. That's more than 10 a year. Can you imagine a car or a plane with that track record? And that people would not go back to the drawing board? Well, a car or a plane crashing kills, you know, 
couple of people or a couple of hundred people, a monetary crash kills many more, entire continents. In Japan, there is a special NGO that has been created for people whose parents, have, whose father has committed suicide because of economic reasons. So that's how we solve that issue. So, in other words, my claim is our conventional money system is structurally unsustainable, unstable. These things are happening systematically. And not only in the last 40 years. Kindleberg has gone back to the 17th century and found regular phenomena like that nature. Good. So, financial crisis has been part of the past and will be part of the future as long as we are keeping the structure of the monetary system as it is. That's my claim. Why? For the last seven years, I've been working with a team in the United States uh, headed by uh, Bob Ulanovich, who, as the name indicates, is obviously American, right? Uh, <laughs> Bob uh, has spent his entire life, he's one of the founders of quantitative ecology. That means he spent his entire career measuring in grams per square meter per year what happens in natural ecosystems. There are thousands of natural ecosystems, right? Very different. The Amazon, the Serengeti Plains, a little puddle in the backyard, right? They're all systems that are where life appears spontaneously and organizes itself as an ecosystem. Now, what all these systems have in common is to be sustainable, right? Nobody is spending time to water uh, the Serengeti Plain or sending fire brigades to take care of that. What is arising there is natural, and all of them are therefore sustainable. And what we found is that all these systems have something in common besides that being sustainable. They actually require a balance between efficiency and resilience. Efficiency is the capacity for a system, a complex flow network, to process volume per year, okay? Resilience is the capacity for a system to change, to adapt, to modify itself when there's an attack, a disease, uh, a problem, or, any, or a change in the environment. Now, these two things are structural variables because they're depending on structural variables. Efficiency and resilience both depend from structural variables, which are diversity and interconnectivity. We are very lucky that it is about that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to say what I'm going to be saying now, that we can learn from this. In natural systems, resilience is two to three times more important than efficiency. In our financial system, resilience doesn't exist. We don't know how to measure it. We don't bother to measure it. We don't even try. The only thing that we look for is efficiency, volume. We define development as GNP per capita, i.e. the volume of financial transactions in the official currency per year, per, i.e. here. Not a word, same thing for the financial system. We compare banks in terms of asset volume. We don't talk about resilience. Good, that's high diversity. That is high interconnectivity. This squirrel has been photographed in Central Park in New York for the last 50 generations. It hasn't eaten anything completely natural. Okay? Everything is brought in. They even eat, even eat cardboard, by the way, I found out. So now, this is low diversity. Good. This is more productive per square meter per year. You have more timber, but you better don't smoke. And you better don't drop a piece of glass. Because with the sun on it, the whole thing will disappear. So low, low resilience, high productivity. 
panda, very simpatico. Everybody loves pandas. Why are they going extinct? That nice animal eats only one type of bamboo. The interconnectivity, zero, actually one. If there's no that bamboo, he doesn't eat. So highly fragile. Now, because diversity and interconnectivity are structural, because of that, and that's the important thing, any, it had there been effect of other things than structure, we wouldn't be able to extrapolate from a natural ecosystem. But because they are structural, two complex flow networks with the same structure have the same behavior pattern. Okay? That's exactly the point. So that means that biomass and ecosystems play the same role as electrons in our electrical, uh, electrical distribution system. Uh, you remember the big blackouts of the United States and in Germany back in the 70s and the early 80s? Where entire, well, half of America at one point lost electricity. Too efficient. It's not accidental that there were two countries that are engineeringly very sophisticated, America and Germany. They've been pushing efficiency to the perfect limit. And then, ping. And nobody understood why they went out. Same problem. Too efficient. Not enough resilience. Now, it also has some diseases, or in the immune system actually relates to the same issue. And finally, money in an economy. We have a monoculture. Diversity, one. And we consider it normal. The entire field of economics, from Adam Smith to this day, have been assuming a single currency in an economy, period. That's it. The fact that it isn't true anymore isn't even taken into account yet. Now, so the key point is, we need monetary diversity, even for the stabilization of the conventional system. And we don't have it. Now, the other point is that resilience requires sacrificing some efficiency. Right? In other words, remember, the pines are more efficient. You make some sacrifice when you go from there. And finally, the digital age monetary innovations provide a whole series of new tools, some of which are cyber currencies that you guys are interested in, that actually provide this diversity, are starting to provide it. They remain marginal in the whole thing. They should actually scale up in order to start playing a role that would be measurably more stable. So what is a systemic solution? There is the, the distribution of uh, efficiency and uh, Resilience, these are the mathematical curves that arise out of it. You can actually have excess efficiency, and that would mean that, that you have brittleness. There's also the possibility of having too many diversities, too much of it. If every Frenchman had a currency, what would be the result? Total stagnation. It's total stagnation. Because everybody would be arguing with everybody else to accept his currency. Okay? So there is a limit. We don't know exactly where the limit lies in the monetary domain, but it's certainly beyond one. Natural ecosystems all fall around that maximum right there, about 97, 98%. With this methodology, we can, for the first time, measure the sustainability of any complex flow network which is you know, a, a significant breakthrough. You usually have not heard people talk about, oh, this is 97% or 93% or 72% sustainable. Now we can. The two extremes are not. Too efficient is not working, and too much diversity either. So that's why we call it the window of viability lies around that maximum, where it's 97, 98% and higher. The current monetary system lives there, way, way out there towards excess efficiency, like the 
electrical distribution systems in Germany and in, in America back in the 1970s. And what, what happens then, when it collapses, if you have a serious collapse, you actually end up on the other end. In other words, let's take the case, say, in Argentina uh, or in Russia, where you had the currency and the banking system collapsing at the same time. That's what we avoided with the euro in 2008. Okay? Uh, actually, everything becomes currency. People fall back on barter. Okay? Shoes and sweaters and anything else can become a currency. We start bartering whatever we have. Way to excess diversity, very inefficient. Now, when you have, let's assume that we take a forest and we throw an atomic bomb over it. Okay? Everything is gone. You come back 30 years later, you will not have nothing happening. There will be a new system that has emerged. How did it do that? What is the path that it followed? The answer is there. You had to collapse. Basically, anything has a chance of trying to emerge. A little bird drops a little seed of anything, and you know it has a chance to try. And, and if it works, it will start multiplying. And slowly on, it will create another ecosystem. So it goes from here back towards the zone, the window of viability, through that mechanism. All right, what do we do in the monetary domain? As soon as possible, let's go back to the monopoly of a single currency. It's called go back to normal. So that's what we do. And we have been doing this little one 425 times in the last 40 years. And there will be 426 and 427. Totally predictable. Because if something really collapses, we automatically go back to the monopoly. And this is the way we're dealing with the system. That's how it repeats itself. We don't give the chance to do this. OK? Now, systemic solution. That's the way we organize money, i.e., big channels, completely prepared. Monopolies, monocultures. And we go to this. Less efficient, more resilient. That's how it works. So you're there, and you slow movie up there. Reducing efficiency. Eh? There is a cost in efficiency. Some of you may have heard arguments from conventional economists saying, oh, well, you know, what you're doing with this other currency stuff is less efficient. And you have to say, yes, it is less efficient, but it is more resilient. And it's not just opinion. This is backed scientifically. Examples. How many of you have heard of the Weir system? OK. All right. This is, Switzerland has been using two currencies for the last 80 years, 8-0. OK. Most people don't know that. Even Swiss don't know that. OK? Why? Well, the central bank, which is a private company owned by banks, by the way, in the case of Switzerland, like the Federal Reserve, uh, has told them not to make any noise. We have three studies that have been proving that the secret for the stability of the Swiss economy is not the mountains, because otherwise the Himalayas would be fantastic. <laughs> It's not the cows, otherwise Normandy would be fantastic. It's certainly not chocolate, otherwise Belgium would be fantastic. <laughs> right? It is this stupid little currency that nobody ever talks about. They have a dual currency system. And this is a private issued currency in a cooperative. And they call it bank because when you open an account with them, you get two accounts, one in Swiss francs and one in Weir. And one Weir equals one Swiss franc, but it's not created the same way. Okay, So the process, you have two currencies with equal value. They're not convertible one into the other. And you have a quarter of all businesses in Switzerland using this currency. And this currency does the opposite of what I showed you at the beginning. It's counter-cyclical. When the economy is bad in Switzerland, the volume of weed and the number of participants increase. 
When there is a boom in Switzerland, it reduces. Why do they do that? If you give the chance to a normal Swiss business guy, and you say, I'm going to pay you to buy something, a thousand Swiss francs or a thousand beer, he will always take the Swiss francs. Why? With the Swiss francs, he can take vacations in Morocco. And with the beer, he has to take vacations in Switzerland. With the Swiss franc, he can pay his taxes. With the weed, he cannot. And he can buy stuff in China, and not only in Switzerland. So it is more liquid, the Swiss franc. Therefore, everybody will prefer it. However, the consequence of that is, if you have a period where there is a boom, and you go into a shop that accepts weed, they'll say, well, can you come back next month? You know? However, if we're in a recession, and you walk in the same shop, they'll accept the weed immediately. So it is counter-cyclical compared to the conventional. And that's the secret why Switzerland is more stable. So we, are we have eight years of high quality data. One of the things that we have to give credit for the Swiss to is they're good at accounting. They do the numbers right. They've never been a year spent without having a track record of it. And the national accounts are a lot better quality than most others. So we have actually the hard facts, the data proving what I'm talking about. This is a smaller sample. Uh, there are now 64 systems in Germany that are uh, dealing with regio currencies. This is the first one in the southern part. And there are about 1,800 businesses participating in this. Uh, these are social purpose systems, currencies other than conventional money that are actually have a social purpose. There's a huge variety of them. Uh, elderly care in Japan, there are 500 systems operational. Uh, currently for elderly care, we're going to have that problem everywhere else. Uh, there are ecological projects in Brazil. Uh, there's one in Belgium that is now operational for the last four years. Uh, learning currencies in Lithuania. There's a whole bunch of innovations that are outside of the cyberspace, but that are already operational and making a difference as we speak. The Terra is a global currency that makes it profitable for multinationals to think long term. This is a proposal. Brazil is currently paying, the central government in Brazil, the federal government, is, is paying for the creation of 200 dual currency banks. Right now, the 180 are operational. Uh, the loyalty currency we already talked about. But there's a, a notion of innovation in that field. And in that same space is what you do. So you're entering a field, the whole cyber currency field, is a field that has for 40 years before Bitcoin existed, what was thought about, has been part of that same wave. And I think it's useful that you guys are aware of that, that you're all entering a space that is not. What's new about it is what we know about it. I'm not saying they're all the same, but they have all the same function. They're complementary to the existing system. They're created in other ways than conventional banking loans. To conclude, a picture will replace lots of words. You can look at it from top down, bottom up. You can look at it from the right or from the left. The picture is fairly homogeneous. And that is what we are currently, where we currently are. Another thing of looking at it is where is that idea of a single currency per country or per market, as we would put today, uh, coming from? Well, what's interesting is all patriarchal societies in history, Sumer, Babylon, Greece, Rome, Western Europe since the Renaissance, most of Chinese history have been using a monopoly of a centralizing currency with interest. Sumer invented writing, patriarchy, 
a monopoly of currency and interest at the same time. Now, it's fairly logical. In a patriarchal society, you tend to have a big boss somewhere. The big boss needs an army. And you know he basically needs an extractive device to concentrate resources at the top. Okay, so there is no exception to this day. The patriarchal systems are actually invariably preferring and usually succeeding in imposing a monopoly of a centralizing currency with interest. Uh, there are some good aspects about that. I would claim that the industrial revolution would never have happened without it. Uh, nobody has started a railroad in a garden or a steel mill in a garage. You need a fair amount of resource concentration at the top in order to do this. So on the other hand, it creates and booms and bust cycles, as we've seen why, right? It creates concentration of wealth, and it's incompatible with community. The more countries are developed, the more there is a community crisis. The areas in the United States that communities still exist are ghettos. The reason is they don't have money. They don't use it either, they don't use it among each other. Now, the opposite of patriarchal societies is not matriarchal societies. Because matriarchal societies have never existed. In a matriarchal society, at its full bloom, you would be the male reduced to procreation. Okay? And have no other function. That's what we did with women until the 19th century. Here. Or still happens, say, in Islamic countries today. Which is the fundamental ferment of the conflict that we're dealing with here. Now, there has never been a matriarchal society. There, the one is the myth of the Amazons, which is a myth. The Amazon, the Greek, the Greek myth, has, there's never been an archaeological, anthropological place where one found matriarchal societies of the sense that we're talking about. There have been matrifocal societies. Matrifocal societies are societies that are uh, honoring feminine values. And we'll see in a few minutes where they come from. Uh, well, in matrifocal societies, they have dual currency systems. They use the patriarchal currency to trade with their neighbors, other countries far away. And they have a different type of currency, bottom up, not centrally down, no interest. The most sophisticated form they have a negative interest rate, a demurrage fee, a penalty. And these systems have, economic, have, have had economic stability for centuries. This was the case, for example, in Egypt, where it lasted over 1,000 years without a recession. Uh, it happened in Western Europe from the 10th to the 13th century, 250 years. It's a time period where the cathedrals were built. And it's not accidental that the cathedrals were built, in the sense that they're all dedicated to a lady. Okay. Now, in these societies, you have, if you're born at the bottom third of society, these are the societies to live in. <laughs> you have a much better chance to make a decent quality of life. Now, how do we know whether we are in a patriarchal or a matrifocal society? The shorthand is the following. Look at the image of the divine. When the image of the divine is a guy with a beard who has created everything without a girlfriend, you probably are in a patriarchal society, OK? I mean, perhaps creating a shocking revelation here, but it should be logical. When the nice role in the divine is played by a lady, Isis in Egypt, Osiris is a poor guy who gets in trouble all kinds of ways, and, Osiris, and Isis saves her repeatedly out of love. Or in the Central Middle Ages, the period of the Black Madonnas, for whom the cathedrals were built. 75 of the cathedrals in France were built for a black Madonna. Okay? And actually, four of the statues involved were Egyptian statues originally imported from Egypt, which is crazy, by right. among others, uh, Louis IX, Louis IX, uh, Saint Louis afterwards. So this is actually a value shift. And I believe we are at a point in our society that if we keep on working in a patriarchal worldview, we won't survive, 
or ecological, or ecological crisis and climate change is exactly about that. It's about relationship with nature and or denial of relationships with nature. So, conclusion. We need monetary diversity. It's now possible with the technologies that you guys are involved in to create a completely different pattern for media of exchange than has been done ever, actually. Uh, and that would really, uh, provide us tools to adapt to the challenges of the 21st century. And I see Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies as part of the emerging process. The, la the last wave in the last for the 40 year development where electronic money, including miles, you may be sure, by the way, that the mile system would never have existed for airlines if you needed an army of clerks to calculate the stuff. It's part of the information age. They only exist because of cheap computing and easy uh, access to, 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 to digitalization. So it's part of a big wave, and you are at the crest of that wave. So it's an interesting place to be. But I think, I hope that it provides you a little bit of a broader picture than what you're used to. I think a new balance between masculine and feminine energy is the challenge of the 21st century. And I think currency will have to do with that. Money will have to play a big role in that. I have a couple of perpetrated a few books in this field. Uh, these are available in several languages, including, by the way, in Chinese, for those who are interested in that. Uh, and there are some other more popular books uh, relating to the same thing. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, exactly. So, first of all, oh. can I answer the questions first and then wear it? Yes, of course. <laughs> So any question? I really don't want to have a shocking strip tease going we on We have here. really the time for questions, so go on. Any question? Just go on. I mean... Yes. Oh, Bertrand. Uh, oh, attendez. I'm not used to the floor. Hello? Hello? Yes? This, just a, it's a clarification, because you have an axis which says on the left, a resilience and on the right efficiency. Yes. But for me, these are two different notions. So why do they, don't you put them on two different axes? In fact, this is a four-dimensional object, yes. and I have not found a way yet to present four-dimensional objects to a public. <laughs> if you guys have found a way, I would be loving to work with you, so we can express this stuff in this space. Okay? But it's a four-dimensional <laughs> object. So this is a simplification. Okay? The maths are available. Okay? And you know, the, the, it can be simulated very easily. But you actually have a movie, because the fourth dimension would be one of the variables, which has to do with precisely the balance between efficiency and resilience. And when you see the efficiency being pushed too far, the, the sustainability collapses. But you're right, it's not a two-dimensional object. Any other question? That was an amazing talk, thank you. You've uh, prompted a lot of thoughts in my mind, and one of them is our relationship to nature. Uh, nice. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about, uh, yeah, that relationship between consciousness and necessity. Yes. It's very, every, every job I've ever had, it was, the first thing I learned how to do was how to get efficient at the job and actually how to cheat at the job as well. And it strikes me, particularly with Bitcoin and the mining, and the, the, the huge rise in the hashing power, apparently it's now 20,000 times uh, the speed of a supercomputer. Do you not think it's a very human thing to seek out efficiencies in our daily projects? And how, and it, how are we going to find compatibility? It is a very human thing in modern times, in our civilization. Uh, in Egypt, Providing meaning was more important than giving efficiency. 
They were not trying to build the pyramids quicker next year. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, in Egypt you had well, I will make the same claim for if you want to build a cathedral. I mean, who is crazy to build all this fancy little sculpture that nobody will ever see, right? I mean, not an efficient way of building a building, is it? But they were built to last. What will be remaining of our civilization in a thousand years besides our nuclear waste? Okay, that we have discounted the cost for to nothing. Okay, none of the buildings that we build will last 100 years. Nothing. So that's where the difference is. So you're right in our civilization, but it's also our civilization that is currently threatening to change climate because of efficiency, with motor automation and all that, I mean, which actually could wipe us out as a species. Us, not only us, but you know, an estimate is for from a biologist is that 70% of biodiversity is going to disappear in the next 20 years. This is the 90% of biologists surveyed have concluded that. So that's where we are. Very efficient. <laughs> However, we don't even know what we're killing. We don't even know the functions of what we're killing. And we may discover very disturbing things too late. So actually, if I understand you correctly, you're saying we need more consciousness. We need to increase we our need, level of awareness. We need consciousness, period. There's a French, Marot, made the point, and I happen to agree with it. The 21st century will be spiritual or will not be. It's very good. OK. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Hi. Uh, I am uh, here on behalf of the Association of the Galico, the Community Currency of Rennes. Uh, we exist since a year now. And uh, I would like to ask you if um, you have a solution for uh, get out from the, the theory of uh, Ernest Schumacher, who told that, um, who was saying that the small is beautiful, like the small has to exist for the for, for making the big to do it as well. And uh, here in Rennes, and as uh, the same in Toulouse or in a lot of places for community currencies, we are just playing in the small is beautiful, but it's not really efficient. We are really, really resilient. No, no problem with that. But how to make it work, really, for in the France, In France, basically, you have, OK, let me be, three types of systems currently in complementary field. I'm working with 50 to give you flavor. And the three you're working with, all the old models that are 30 years old, and have a characteristic in common. They're not scalable. Uh, Le Cell, which is the LETS that was started in 1982 in Canada, right? That's the model that's the most common. Uh, you have accorderie that I call here, which is basically time banking, which also dates from 1985, okay, in the world. And you have Le Sol, which is a more modern model, but actually has been designed, funded by the EU, and it's been designed by big businesses, and it has all the characteristics of big business. Top-down model, top-down systems, without any input from the bottom. These are the three systems that exist. Sol has been a failure, except in Toulouse, with the Sol Violet, and the other ones are all fine. They're small. Today, the leading country in the world in the complementary currency field that I'm looking at is Brazil. Right? In Europe, it's England. You have, let me give you an example of England. The Bristol Pound, a city of what, about 200, 250,000 people. Uh, the mayor is paid 100% of his salary in Bristol Pounds. And uh, the Bristol Pound is accepted in payment of taxes. OK? Uh, so you can see where we are not here, all right? And the mayor is promoting the system himself, OK? There is the first cases where some local authorities in France are looking. There's one in, in, in the southwest of France, the Occito, that just been launched. It will be launched in the, oh, actually in January. Uh, so where the first time authorities are actually playing a role. In Brazil, that's 20 years ago, right? 
So in other words, France is not the leading country. And I would say it's fortunate in some level, because if that were the leading country, I would be a very pessimistic. You need to have scalable models. Uh, a lead system, a cell, I have not seen a case that has more than 500 active people. You cannot solve the kind of social problems that we're dealing with by units of 500. I compare this to the capillary systems in your vessels. Capillary systems are very nice. They keep you warm, they give you color, okay? However, if you count on that to save you from a heart attack, you're in trouble, okay? We need aortas. We need business to business systems, like in Switzerland or in Brazil. That is the kind of system that actually has a capacity to, to scale up. A quarter of all businesses are participating in, 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 in Switzerland. When you get to that level, it starts having a macroeconomic effect. You can't do that with the kind of models that are currently operational in France. And by the way, let me emphasize, I'm not against the small scale models, okay? I'm just saying they're not enough. It's not with that that you can build up an ecosystem. Is that answer clear? So I'm encouraging the, the small systems, okay? But we need to have authorities involved on other models that can scale up. That's what's missing. And, and the European continent, eh? Germany is a little better than, than, than France, but not much. England is the better one on the continent, in Europe. Hi, I have just another question. So it's uh, just a comment about, uh, well, I like the sustainability of the ecosystem yes. and resiliency and so on. But to, to what concern, let's say, the short-term investment that you showed at the beginning, right? Yes. That, I mean, people tend to do, to go for a short-term investment. Uh, this somehow is kind of in contrast uh, with the uh, the resiliency that you put in place, that you like Correct. to put in place, and uh, also to have uh, an ecosystem that will be sustainable. So with the modern, modern economy, so people tend to do like short-term investment because they don't know what is going to happen, let's say, in the future, and maybe just to anticipate a, a crisis or whatever, a collapse. So they prefer, you know, to have uh, maybe to, to gather less as revenue immediately than uh, I have long-term investment that uh, might be burned by any other side effects that they cannot predict at the beginning. And how do you comment that? Okay. The, I mentioned actually the solution, but I didn't develop it. The Terra currency that I was mentioning earlier is a currency with a demurrage fee. Demurrage is a negative interest rate. Okay? It's actually similar to what the Egyptians were doing. Let me explain. Uh, this would be a currency that is fully backed, 100% backed, by a basket of commodities, including oil, copper, wheat, the, usual, the most important commodities in the world. When you have a fully backed currency, you have a storage cost. The storage cost would be paid by the bearer of the currency. Okay? Today, it is absorbed as we showed in, in the price of the goods, when you buy a liter of gasoline, you know that in Europe, for example, all the oil companies are supposed to, are having, or obliged to have, three months of crude in storage in the European continent, in the harbors, typically, with old tankers. Okay? There's a cost in that. When you buy a liter of gasoline, you may be sure it's, you're paying that storage cost. Okay? Now, what would happen if you have a currency with a negative interest rate that pays for that storage cost? When you look at discounted cash flow, the future is more important than the present. It reverses the equation. It reverses the process. And that is what was happening in the Central Middle Ages, and that was happening in Egypt. And nobody was standing on a, on a, on a box to I tell them, think about your grandchildren. They were spontaneously doing things for the long term. They were rationally doing things for the long term. When you build a cathedral, you were not going to be seeing it. Okay? Uh, there's going to be three, four generations before the thing is finished. If you go to Chartres here, not that far, okay, this city still lives today from the investment made in 1280. 
Okay? They're still living from that today. By investing in the nicest cathedral. Why were they doing all these fancy little things? It was an investment into the future. And it's still valid today. So my argument is, you're right, people are thinking only short term. Are you saying to me that the people in the Middle Ages were somehow more clairvoyant about the future than we are today? No. They're being programmed differently. They had a currency that had, they had a renovatio monete, which I can get into, okay, which is basically providing that you don't save value. The savings tool is not money. It's an orchard. It's a, an irrigation system. It's a cathedral. That's how they save money. They were not saving it in the form of money. They save it in terms of investments in the long term. The same thing was true in Egypt. Yeah, and they were not more sophisticated than we are. Yeah, maybe I'm not that familiar, let's say, with the old economy in the, in the past, but let's say that all the currencies that we have right now, they need to be backed up by whatever reserve of gold, and then we have the governments no. on the back and so on. So let's say still uh, going, let, let's say, to the, the, to the investment uh, about if I, the, if I had to create an investment as a, as a person, not, uh, uh, let's say, in the, in the economy and creating my startup or whatever. Or you mentioned also the example of the, of the business manager, you know, the type of yes. investment he does for his company or for his sons, then uh, we have a different type of scale. So somehow we need also but to... But we're being to programmed differently. The reason that this CEO in Germany was thinking about his children differently than his business is that he didn't justify the investment in his children in the basis of currency. It was not with a discounted cash flow, right? If you use a discounted cash flow, the future does not matter when you have a positive interest rate. That's the point. And when you have a negative interest rate, okay, a demurrage fee, the opposite happens. The future is more important. Okay? We don't know this. I mean, by the way, all national currencies are the same. Huh? And when you refer to, uh, they're created the same way. Interestingly enough, most people are not aware that the Soviet system or the Maoist system was the same. Okay? They were using the same mechanism to create money, bank debt. The only difference, <laughs> with interest, the only difference is that in the Soviet system or the Maoist system, the banks were owned by the government. This happens in Western society, in capitalist society, only when the banks don't work. They're worthless. That's when the government takes over. Okay? But otherwise, it's privatized. That's the difference. It's not a different system. So we're being programmed. And the reason that the Soviet system and the Maoist system and our capitalist system are the same, my claim is they're all patriarchal societies when they were designed. Okay? That's what they had in common. So they use the same money, a monopoly of a single currency with interest. When you do that, if you're rational, the future doesn't matter. And that's the difference with this German guy. When he's thinking about his children, he doesn't justify it on a discounted cash flow. In his business, he has to. He's obliged legally. He, otherwise, he'll be attacked by the shareholders. Right? So we're being programmed. That's the point. It's not just a question of modernism. We're not modern. I claim the different program. And of course, conventional, the, the conventional economics assumes that money is neutral. There is no other way possible, which is another trap. And the final point I'd like to make about what you said, the gold standard worked because it was a lie. It wasn't true. In, by, the, by, the, by the 1900, at the blossoming of the uh, English managed uh, gold standard, 12% of the pounds were backed by gold. 98% were like we do have today. Bullshit. Okay? So it was a lie. I'm talking about the real stuff. <laughs> All right? The transparency. Last question. Thank you. Um, uh, just another comment. I apologize for my bad English. Um, I'm not involved in anything. Yes, but <laughs> there is some English in the room, so we have to speak in English. Je vais quand même essayer. 
Um, so uh, I just wanted to say, I just, <laughs> Stefan, <laughs> I just wanted to say that I'm not involved in anything about um, uh, currency expertise, but uh, your speech uh, not only was very interesting, but also I feel myself very involved uh, in the analysis concerning uh, the criteria of um, resilience and efficiency yes. in another way and in many, many other fields that are my fields of working, especially setting up projects with real people in new kind of places yeah. where we are the same people, but sharing tools, sharing knowledge and yes. these things together. And I think what is very, very important for me after your speech is to um, make the people see uh, in their own context, for example, building hackerspace, fab labs, new places, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps thinking differently the way we could use our tools in um, r relations, um, knowledge, places, tools uh, in the territory. I'm working for a territory. I think it's a very important keys. They are very important keys to revisit things like factories, things like um, the way we are using the space in the cities, the time and relations. And I thank you a lot for that because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain all those kind of things with the same terms of resilience and efficiency uh, in my projects to people working at a um, regional and uh, local field mm -hmm. for Rhein metropolitan area. And uh, for the moment, my difficulty is that always the uh, criteria of efficiency with old criteria, it means how many money, how many projects for how many people of how many money and so on. Um, it's very difficult for me to prove that we are more efficient, mm -hmm. you see? But it's very easy for me to prove that we are more resilient, that yeah. uh, the things are going to move away a long time with real people uh, able to upcycle mm -hmm. the things around them. So I thank you a lot for I the arguments. I actually fully agree with you. Let me use another vocabulary, which is actually, for my opinion, the better one, but it is, sounds exotic, which is the reason I don't use it. But it is more rigorous. For those familiar with Taoism, okay, uh, the issue is a balance between yin and yang. Okay? And our money system is a hyper yang system. Every feature about it is yang. It's concentrating, it's top down, it's and so on. So uh, we need a new balance between yin and yang. But between the masculine and the feminine. That's why I was using that image later, saying that we need a balance between masculine and feminine. I was alluding to that factor. The work I've been doing with Olanovich is the first Western scientific demonstration that all living systems depend a lot more on the dynamics of the yin-yang of the Taoist than what we are familiar with, than the linear causalities that we're familiar with. The split is between Taoism and the Aristotle. With Aristotle, we have been you know, believe, understanding cause and effect. And that's, by the way, why we need a god. Right? We need an ultimate cause, right? What is the cause of the cause, and so on. So, or a big bang in science. We need something that begins. Not in Taoism. In Taoism, you have an interaction, a dance between the two polarities in every field. And it's that balance, that search for balance, that actually creates evolution. And we've been able to prove this scientifically on the basis of entropy. Now, entropy is the most universal law in the universe. One of the consequences of entropy is gravity. So you know, what we're doing is kind of living in economics as if you're doing architecture without gravity. It's that fundamental. And we've been proving this scientifically. So that's what I was alluding to. And by the way, the articles that I was referring to at the, in the research department, they're available there, for if you went. But what you're saying is true. The open source is the yin process. It's a yin process. And that's why you have such an enormous difficulty to explain it to people who are living in the young world. OK? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>